Hey guys, welcome to another video. This video will be about 10 gigabit networking at home. And it's probably going to be a two-parter, but let's get started with this because I bought a new 8-port 10 gigabit switch, which is only $269. So, before we get into that, and I really want to open it because I haven't opened it yet, but we'll do that together. Let's talk a little bit about the options you have when you want 10 gigabit at home. So we're all used to using these UTP cables or ethernet, and they come with uh, eight little wires in there and you have cat 5e and cat 6, cat 6a, cat 7. And for gigabit, it really didn't matter all that much. You could get 100 meters of gigabit with cat 5e for 10 gigabit however especially over copper as this would be called um, that's a bit different you kind of need at least cat 6 and then you're still limited by distance and the higher up you go so cat 6a adds some shielding and thicker wires and cat 7 uh, adds uh, shielding around every wire pair the signal or crosstalk nego negation, I should say, becomes better. And, well, your 10 gigabit will transfer f uh, further or last longer on a longer, further cable, whatever. Um, so cable quality does come into play. And that's one reason why 10 gigabit hasn't become commonplace in the workplace yet, because a lot of buildings have been cabled with Cat5e and, well, you can't really transfer 10 gigabit over that reliably for the long distances those cables are. So they've made some new standards for that. That's called 2.5G and 5G. And those can run over CAT5e. But we're talking about 10 gigabit today. So um, you need a 10 gigabit network card for that. Now, in the server world, these are almost standard by now. But in the desktop world, you're still getting a normal gigabit NIC on your motherboard. The reason for that has been power draw. 10 gigabit equipment, and you can see that by this uh, giant heatsink here, draws a lot more power, especially the copper variant instead of the fiber variant, than gigabit does. And we've had to wait until they could shrink down the process nodes to lower the power usage of 10 gigabit. And we're around that point that this is becoming viable. So we're also starting to see 10 gigabit switches for at home, like uh, like my little box here. But uh, yeah, so cabling options. You have, of course, the standard Ethernet. And if you have this in your home, it's a good option. But for 10 gigabit, you have different options. So these two uh, go together and... Uh, you get a 10 gigabit connection as long as your cable isn't too long or it's high enough quality. Okay, but let's leave RJ45 copper for what it is, because with 10 gigabit, you often see cards like this. And this card has two SFP plus slots. And I'll have links to all kinds of stuff in the description, uh, including some newer cards, because this is an Intel X540, which only supports 10 gigabit. But newer variants, which cost about a hundred bucks now, so that's starting to become affordable, also support the new five and two and a half gigabit speeds. But I'll link everything in the description. Uh, but these cards have SFP plus slots. And what that means is that you can either take a fiber transceiver or a copper transceiver nowadays with 10 gigabit. This is very new or, which has been done a lot, is use one of these DAC cables or DAC cables. These come in lengths up to, generally up to 5 meters. You can get them up to 10 or active DAC can go even longer. Um, but that gets a lot more expensive. Cables like this on eBay, you can get for like 20 bucks. And this is a Mellanox Connect X, what is actually Connect X3? You can get Connect X2s also. And you can get those for like 20, 30 bucks on the cheap. And well, the SFP cables work like this. Oops, let me see if I can do this on camera. 
Nope, wrong way around. You kind of stick it in there, and then the other side is also attached to it, and you stick that into another cart or a switch. So that makes cabling options a bit more limited than you can do with a uh, Ethernet cable. You can just disconnect. Um, the other option for that is, as I showed earlier, fiber. And fiber can be had in uh, gigabit and 10 gigabit. And then there's two standards. There's um, multi-mode and single mode. Now this cable is yellow, that means it's single mode. And single mode is suited up to 10 kilometers, or well, it depends on the, on the SFP or SFP plus model you're using. But let's just say single mode generally is good for 10 kilometers. And multi-mode, in that's mostly orange or nowadays turquoise or gray or pink, or they have all kinds of different standards for that with OM3s and OM4s. You don't have to remember all that, but... Um, Multi-mode is generally cheaper than single mode, and you can get a multi-mode SFP like this for about 40, 50 bucks, and on Ebays and stuff like that, you can get it even cheaper. So if you need to do a longer run in your house and you can't use a DAC cable, you can use a fiber cable. And, well, as said, you can also use a normal Ethernet cable, as long as it's good enough quality. Um, but that's actually often a more expensive option than using fiber cable with some SFP plus NICs. So, after confusing the hell out of you, what should you buy for a home situation? Well, to keep it cheap, you can buy two of these NICs with a DAC cable, make a direct connection between two PCs, and you're done. That works, and you get full 10 gigabit, it's awesome. And you can be done for 100, 150 bucks. If you want to elaborate on that and you have multiple PCs, you can buy a switch which also has SFP slots, and then you can hook up multiple SFP DAC PCs. That works, but you're kind of constrained by these cables which you can't really route through anything and everything has to be in the same room. I don't have that, most people don't have that. So, you can go the simpler route, and that's using a 10 gigabit Ethernet NIC, or nowadays the 2.5 and, and the 5 gigabit NICs, and um, connect it together that way. But as I said, CAT 5E, you won't get that far, so I really recommend CAT 6 or CAT 6A or even CAT 7 for that. That's partly the reason why I used CAT 7 throughout the whole house. Um, and another option, as I said, is fiber. Fiber is probably actually cheaper than um, the Ethernet option. But, well, you have to run a special fiber cable and you have to get fiber SFPs. And I know that can get confusing. So hopefully this shows you what options there are a little bit. And um, let's take a look at that switch because I'm really, really wanting to see that. So my Skycam should be active and hopefully you can follow along. Because this is basically the first time that for $269, you get an 8-port SFP Plus switch, um, which is passively cooled, so no fans, which can basically do wire speed. So, well, let's just take it right out and let's see what comes with it. So there's only this uh, tiny little power brick, and this is 24 volt, 1.2 amps. So that's about 30 watts. Okay, that's probably why it has this uh, this giant heatsink on the back um, to uh, passively cool it. And then it actually comes with some rack ears. Cool. Okay. Oh, it has one long one and one short one. But I'll show you later on how it looks when I install it in my rack. Okay, well, this box can go. So let's take a quick look at that. On the front, we see the eight 10 gigabit SFP plus slots. And as I said, you can use that for either a DAC cable, for a fiber cable, or actually for 10 gigabit ethernet. Nowadays, they have these modules. They cost about $60 a piece, but then you can use 10 gigabit ethernet in your SFP plus switch. It's not compatible with everything, but with this switch, it should work. 
So in my case, I'm going to use a mix of cables in my house. I'm going to use some DAC cables to attach my router and my switches, which all have a 10 gigabit uplink port. And my desktop is beneath my patch cabinet, as I've shown before. And so I'm going to use a DAC cable there too, because it's by far the cheapest option. But my two servers are on the other side of the house. And for that, I have CAT7. And we're going to use one of these or two of these modules on the switch side and then use the Intel 10 gigabit NICs in the servers. So that way I should have a 10 gigabit backbone in the form of this, uh, this actually pretty tiny switch and everything that I need 10 gigabit on should be 10 gigabit connected. Another thing this switch can support if you want it, it has a single power input on the back, but there's also a gigabit port on the front and you can use that for PoE input like 48 volts. And then it basically has a dual power supply if you're looking for that. So what I'm curious about is if it powers on and if it does, I'm very curious to look inside. So let's first check it works because this, I literally just took it out of the box. I guess it should show you. I don't know. Can you see that? Oh, there's a speaker inside. Nice. Not all MicroTix include a speaker anymore, but I like having them in there. Ah, uh, there's the MicroTix blue power LED power beam. Because if you forget the MicroTix switch is still running, just turn off the lights and you'll see all the blue power LEDs. No clue why they do that. So, it's turned on. And my little watt meter over here is saying 5.45 watt. That's not a lot. Um, that's perfectly acceptable for a switch, especially a 10 gigabit switch. But let's see what happens if... Oh, it's still booty. So let's plug in one of these copper SFPs because the limiting factor of these is power draw. And let's see if that changes the usage. Right now it's using about 6.5 watts. And if I plug this in... He uses about eight, so that's one and a half watts. But even with a few of those connected, that's not too bad. They do advise you though, even though these ports are spaced, bleh, sorry about that. Uh, even though these ports are spaced, if you can space them apart from each other, because although you can now get 10 gigabit ethernet in small SFP plus modules, they do tend to get a little bit warmer than a fiber module would. It's odd because there's a laser in here and there isn't in there, but that's just the way how it works. Um, so if you can space them out with some empty slots or some DAC or fiber cables in between, that's best for cooling. Okay. Um, well, enough talking about that. Let's uh, take a quick look inside of the switch. If you're not going to rack mount the switch, they also include some rubber feet because this is a table model. So you could use it that way if you want to. Okay. Looking inside of the switch, we see a pretty beefy CPU cooler plate thing with heat pipes connected to the external fins. And that's how they uh, try to keep it cool. Other than that, it's, uh, it's a pretty neat layout. Yep. There's the little beeper I mentioned. Huh. Interesting. This board actually has connectors for PSU1 and PSU2. That leads me to think that they're going to put out a dedicated rack model which has a dual power supply inside of it later on. Okay, interesting. Well, I like having the passive one because my uh, wiring cabinet is inside of my office. So having all passive equipment is, well, very much preferred. Other than this... 8 times 10 gigabit port model, they also introduced a 4 10 gigabit port model, which is even cheaper than this one. So this one was 269, and the 4 times 10 gigabit plus 1 times gigabit is only 149. So if you want to add 10 gigabit for just a few PCs, that's a very, very doable price, I would say. Another thing I'd like to note is that while this is a Mikrotik product, it can run router OS or switch OS. But if you run router OS, although this has a pretty decent dual core 800 megahertz CPU, don't expect 10 gigabit if you're not putting it into switch mode. 
So each port can be configured either in bridge mode, which can be done by the hardware, or in software mode, where you can give the port an IP, do routing, NAT, layer three stuff, firewalling, all that kind of stuff. And the, the CPU is in there is actually pretty decent. Dual core 800 megahertz will do a gigabit, one and a half gigabits of NAT and some firewall rules and stuff like that. But if you start adding some queries and maybe some more filter rules and stuff like that, it quickly drops down to a few hundred megabits. That isn't really a problem, but since you have mostly 10 gigabit ports, I'd advise to treat this unit basically as a switch and don't expect too much from all the router OS and MicroTik features besides the switching. So I'm going to end this video with some shots of it installed in my rack so you can see how it looks in the rack rails and I'm going to leave it there for today. In a follow up video, I'll talk a little bit more about installing these network cards and working with the uh, the DAC cables and or uh, fiber and ethernet. And I'll also show you some throughput results and stuff like that. But from what I've read online, it uh, behaves very well. It's totally silent because it's passively cooled. It only uses a little bit of power, hence the small external adapter. And well, should be great. So if you have any questions, let me know down in the comments. But if you'd like to have a longer discussion about it, Hit me up on our Discord server and ask your questions there. Thank you for watching and hopefully see you back next video. Bye bye.